welcome as we are gathered here today, here in person and at joining online as we remember Muriel. In my little bit of knowing Muriel, um, I would argue she deserves a far bigger celebration because she was not a small person in any way and always brought a smile to my face when I got to visit with her. Um, and so I know that there are people who would like to be here but uh, due to, to illness are not here. I know there are people who would like to be here um, and just are not able to. And so we will gather together knowing that this is not really the end of Remembering, this is not the end of conversation. This is not the end of the stories. This is just another uh, mile marker on this journey. Immediately following the service, we will gather uh, for the graveside service. Uh, that is a brief service, uh, but it is a beautiful day, so uh, that will not be a hardship to be outside today. Uh, there will be a time of remembrances, and I will uh, hand you the microphone. Uh, and invite you to, to be in the center uh, for those remembrances. We begin. Welcome in the name of Jesus, the Savior of the world. We are gathered to worship, to proclaim Christ crucified and risen, to remember before God our sister Muriel, to give thanks for her life to commend her to our merciful Redeemer, and to comfort one another in our grief. We were baptized in Christ Jesus. And when we were baptized in Christ Jesus, we were baptized into his death. We were buried, therefore, with Christ by baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might live a new life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. Eternal God, maker of heaven and earth, who formed us from the dust of the earth, who by your breath gave us life, we glorify you. Jesus Christ, the resurrection and the life, who suffered death for all humanity, who rose from the grave to open the way to eternal life, we praise you. Holy Spirit, author and giver of life, the comforter of all who sorrow, our sure confidence and everlasting hope, we worship you. To you, O blessed Trinity, be glory and honor forever and ever. Amen. There are several songs. <clears throat> that have been chosen for this day, along with uh, the scripture readings. The first is, When Peace Like a River.
with the sign of the cross, the sign of the one who brings us from death into life, from darkness into light. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And let us pray. O God of grace and glory, we remember before you today our sister Muriel. <coughs> We thank you for giving her to us to know and to love as a companion in our pilgrimage on earth. In your boundless compassion, console us who mourn. Give us faith to see that death has been swallowed up in the victory of our Lord Jesus Christ, so that we may live in confidence and hope until by your call we are gathered to our heavenly home in the company of all your saints. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Muriel Eileen Holmquist Peterson entered this world on October 6, 1924, in Armour Township, south of Bowman, North Dakota. She was the next youngest of eight children born to Frank and Emma Erhammer Holmquist who had homesteaded on the prairies of southwest North Dakota in 1907. She was reared on the family farm and attended Medicine Hills Rural Middle, uh, Grade School. She was baptized and confirmed in the Lutheran faith in Bowman. She learned many lessons about survival and responsibility early in her life. Besides growing up during the Depression, her mother passed away when she was 14 years old. She had a severe bout with rheumatic fever when she was 15 years old and was near death for two weeks at Holy Rosary Hospital in Lyle City. When she went back to Bowman, she lived with her cousin Leslie Anderson and his wife Nora from August to November 1940. She lived in Powell, Wyoming with their sister Bernice and husband Ed Freetag from November 1940 to Easter of 1941. Her father passed about this time, just four years after losing her mother. After all of this, she went back to high school and graduated from Bowman High School in 1943. With the loss of both parents at such a young age in World War II, her life was shaped forever. 
On April 24, 1944, she married Kenneth M. Peterson in Fort Pierce, Florida. He was discharged from the Navy in December of 1945, and they farmed south of Bowman until July of 1949. During this time, three children joined this union, Kenneth L., Gary, and Renee. They moved to Miles City, Montana, where she devoted her life to being a wife, mother, homemaker, and grandmother. Her parents and siblings were always on her mind as she loved them all and never forgot her heritage. Everyone came first, and she went without so we could have. She was the glue and peacemaker of the family. Haying and harvest time, community gatherings, and old-time dances were among her fondest memories. She was an outstanding seamstress, baker, cook, and housekeeper. She would help those in need without fanfare and had a great sense of humor. In September of 2015, she moved to Highgate Senior Living in Billings, and with the outstanding care they provided, she had five great years. She loved her time there and the entire staff. Thank you, Highgate. Our mother and grandmother exited this world because of COVID-19 into her Savior's hands on November 5th, 2020. She did this with calmness, peacefulness, and was pain-free. She has joined her husband, Kenneth M., who preceded her in death in 1999, along with her parents, five brothers, and one sister. Muriel has looked forward to this reunion for quite some time. With the love and care you provided, as well as the laughter and fun that engulfed our home, we were the richest family in town. We did not realize we were poor until we left home. Love you, Mom. The kids. At this time, I invite those who would like to, to share a remembrance. Nobody wants to go. I uh, thought what I was, I've been thinking about what I was going to say. I didn't break no ghosts at home. And I thought we could tell some of the funny things that happened while we grew up. We could talk about her life at Highgate and what a spark plug she was out there. When she moved to Highgate, we didn't think she was going to live six months. After three or four months, after three months, she broke a hip. Ended up six weeks in rehab, and when she came out of there, she was like a prairie flower. I mean, she blossomed, and she had four good years out there that uh, were equal to none. And then I thought, rather than that, we all know the stories. We all know how she did out there. But the last two weeks, after after. First of all, I'd like to thank Gary and Renee for taking care of her here in Miles City for 20 years or so. And I can't tell you how much I enjoyed taking care of Mother the last five years. It's been an absolute pleasure. I got to know her. And then last week when I started packing her belongings, I really got to know her. And uh, things that happened years ago shaped her life forever. The loss of her parents, the dependence on the rest of the family for her. They took good care of her. And uh, when I look back on it, I never heard my mother say a bad word about anybody, and you hear that at every funeral, but I never heard my mother belittle anybody. Um, and then when I look back at it, she was brought up that way due to the fact that I can't remember any of her Holmquist siblings ever saying anything bad about anybody. Uh, they might joke about something, but they never be little them. And that dawned on me when I started going through her things. Besides that, 
we kind of laughed at the way Mother did things, how she was so well organized, how she could make do with very little. Somebody showed up at the house at supper time, she always figured out a way to get them fed. Um, and as I went through her stuff, I found some different things. One of the verses that's going to be a, well, I need to explain this. A couple years ago, Mother says to me one day when I went there visiting, she said, what are you going to do this afternoon? And I said, I don't have anything planned. She said, well, then we'll do my funeral. So we did her funeral. She, everything in here is how she wants it, except she wanted communion. And uh, so we got 90% of it anyway. She picked the songs, she picked the verses, and when she picked the verses, they were very simple, as you'll see. But that explained to me, if you think about it, Mom was a very simple person, but she was as complex as you could get. She, she thought everything out. She knew when she looked at Highgate what room she wanted. And she held out for it. They'd offer her a room. She said, no, I told you where I wanted to go. And she got it. But one of the verses in here is Psalm, Psalms 4.8. One verse, and I'm thinking, why? As you hear what she reads, has read to you, it'll make more sense. It'll make more sense of who she is. And by the way, I found this bookmarker. I can't swear that's where it came from, but it was in her confirmation papers. So that is, my God, that's 70 years ago, 80 years ago. But it was still in there. I want to read you a little note. This is from Highgate. They gave her a little um, notepad and everything. But it says, first of all, I've got to tell you, she went out with us a few years ago when Marge and I were doing Salvation Army feeding the street people. And she got in the bus and rode with us, and that struck her deeply in her heart for her, her concern. And here's what Highgate wrote. Muriel sparked our biggest outreach yet by pairing us with Salvation Army. She talked Highgate into making three to four hundred sandwiches a month to feed the street people. And that was a sight to behold when you walked in that lobby and you had about ten women at 80 years old or older, slapping bologna and cheese, <laughs> ziplocking the bags, and they did that every month. Says she's funny, caring, and quick-witted as all heck. And that kind of fit her over there. She became kind of a caregiver there herself. Inside one of the envelopes, in there with all this other stuff, I found little notes and jewels that pretty well explained my mother. September 10th, 1980. Dear Kenny and Muriel, this is for all the things you two have done for Bev and I during the right years. And most especially for being there when I needed a friend the most. You two and one other person are the only people who I felt were still my friends. And let me tell you, there are times in a person's life when you need a friend. And you two have made me feel like maybe I was worthy of being your friend. I thank you both from the bottom of my heart. And may I never forget what you've done for me. And then he said, please go to the Red Rock and have a nice meal on me. You don't... These people at that time were 
55, 60 years old. And that was a fellow that Dad worked with. And evidently, uh, he was having a very tough time at the time, and they took him, took him in. Gary, I got two notes here that she hung on to from the Navy. <laughs> well, that was after that incident. <laughs> <laughs> that in the Prairie, Prairie County Sheriff. Sure. <laughs> One of them says, I, Gary Peterson, will you all my, all my earthly possessions and, and also one pair of worn out shorts. <laughs> Gary Peterson, U.S. Navy. <laughs> Then you wrote one off from a steak dinner. I'm going to give those to you. That come back from what, about 1970? Yeah, maybe, yeah, about 70. Now, Dad had an eighth grade education, and Mom finally graduated from high school. And their beginning years were not easy, if you can imagine. Leaving the farm, three kids under six years old and moving into a two-room motel room here in Miles City with no job. And they made it through. But I've never seen anything like their bookkeeping. Bev, you could take a lesson in accounting from her. <laughs> it's unreal. Here is I don't know why they kept them, but there are three receipts from Glen Standard Service Station here in Miles City that the car was serviced from 1956 and 1957. Why they're in there, I do not know. She had a medical book that she started back late 50s, early 60s. She had a record of almost every doctor's appointment, and she could tell you in that book what was wrong, and sometimes they used that book to get their medical records right. She had the same thing with all her meds. You can go back to about 1970, and she had all her meds recorded. Very, very organized. She also thought things through very clearly. And her last decision was to, uh, her and I had sat in with hospice. And uh, when it was all over, well, when we listened to them, I was kind of against it when I went into it. And she listened and we explained to her that it didn't mean she was terminal. It just meant that they wanted to get to know her a little bit before it had to be. And when we sat for two hours, I said, Mom, I said, what do you want to do? I said, you want me to call Gary and Renee and talk about it? Or do you want to think about it? Or She said, sign the papers. Sign the papers. She would already thought that far ahead. Best thing that happened. If she hadn't signed them papers that day and we hadn't been in hospice, I had never got up to see her two weeks ago. I got to spend the last five days with her at, at uh, Highgate. If she'd have been in the hospital, I'd have never got in. So uh, she, didn't, she didn't miss a stroke as far as thinking things out. What may, we may have thought was pure luck was not pure luck in their lives. They, they had it all planned. I am not here today to grieve my mother. I'm here to celebrate her life. Because everything she ever did in her life made it easy for us. And we didn't realize it at the time. And 
after five years with her in Highgate, I got to know her. And for the last two years, Mother wanted to pass away. She wanted to. She wanted to go visit her family and brothers and sisters and dad, and she made no bones about it. And that's what she told hospice when they signed her up, was that nothing like ventilators or emergency room or the intensive care, you just keep me comfortable. And they did that. And she went very quietly, peacefully, and, and uh, we couldn't ask for anything more. We got a, got a deal from Highgate today. And Miss Gail at the Senate, um, her and administrator, this Gail's kind of the business manager, and uh, two nurses came to Miles City with an interview mom up at uh, Eagles Manor. And that was at a time when mom was sleeping 24 hours a day and things were not going well. And when they left, they said, we want her. She put a smile on her face. And not all, she not only always answered them directly, but they figured out what she was talking about. It says, hello, my name is Megan Wilson. And we would like this read at neural service during the sharing section, please. Thank you very much. Hello everyone, this is Megan Wilson from Highgate Senior Living. To Muriel's families, we are so sorry that we cannot be there with you all today, remembering such a wonderful woman. But we wanted to protect all of you from any possible exposure through us. Muriel's absence from our community is already so sadly missed. She had a wit about her that could make you your rushed and crazy days stop. Take a breath and laugh with her. She always had the best candy stash and she shared with all of us from her bingo triumphs. And she had the spirit of someone you hoped you'd grow up to be like. My favorite thing was listening to her son Ken harass her and watch this sweet old woman snap right back at him and put him in his place. Gosh, we loved watching them interact. It was clear that she loved her family dearly and they loved her even more. We didn't know Muriel would be with us so long and we are so thankful for the years we got to know her and share in her life. Please know that she was our family, and so are all of you. We love you and pray for peace and the memories you'll share. Love your Highgate family. I don't think they send that to everybody. And uh, the staff did love her. And one other thing, when she moved in there on the 24th of September of 2015, there was a woman working there as a caregiver. And she was the first one that worked with mom quite a bit. And she's the one that encouraged mother to get up and to get moving in the first three months. And they became like sisters. And they fought like sisters. <clears throat> they teased one another. The woman had been there 15 years. The night mom passed and I, and I notified her downstairs. She's the one that came up and did the final things they have to do there. And she stood there and cried like a little baby. And then she looked at me and she said, uh, I have to tell you. She said, about three days ago or two days ago, when she started, it was two days, she had gotten to the point that she couldn't speak, but she could move her lips. And she said, I walked in to help her. And she said she saw me and gave me a ration of crap like you can't believe by just moving her lips. <laughs> she said, I knew what she was saying, but it wasn't audible. And she said, all I could do is stand there and smile at her. 
And that's the way you want, well, it's right up to the end. The other thing I'd like to bring up, two, the two days before she passed away, I called family members and put, it, put the phone on speakerphone, and mom wasn't, she was aware of what was going on, but she was not, I don't know how you put it, she, she wasn't social as far as talking or this and that, but when I put that phone to her ear and she recognized the voice and you said who it was, she knew who it was, she gave me facial expressions that I knew that she was happy. So that's the best thing that could have happened was when we were able to get in there and she got to talk or listen to you people. That's, I have millions of memories of her and a lot of them out of the last five years. And maybe someday when this COVID's over we can sit down and have a few laughs. She, she had them, and she's where she wants to be right now. Thank you. Seth, can you hear me? I'm not sure I'll make it through this. When I sat down to write about my grandma, I realized she had lived a lifetime before I was part of her life. This seemed impossible, because until November 5th, my life had always included her. I do not know what she was like as a young woman, a wife or a mother. I knew her simply as my grandma. The fondest memories of my childhood were in a house on Marion Street. My grandma always had a look of joy when we burst through that back screen door. I will never forget the smile, the light in her eyes when she would see me, it didn't matter if I was five, if I was 15, or if I was 40. She always had that same look, and it was a look that told me, undeniably, that I was loved and wanted in that space and time. As a small child, I remember bath times, blowing bubbles with wooden spools. I remember a bottomless cookie jar, and she would reach in and tell me she was finding the one with the most chocolate chips just for me. I remember just a shadow of sugar on my cereal. I remember being in awe when I first watched her dance with my grandpa. I had no idea my grandma could glide with such beauty and grace across the country dance floor. I remember overnights when I was teased for stealing Grandpa Pete's spot in bed, but my spot was always next to her. I grew up, and at each stage she was there. When I was home from college once in a moment of adolescent drama, I told my grandma I was confused and felt like I had to find myself, but I wasn't even sure what that meant. She gave me a lemon bar, a cup of coffee, and said, merciful heavens, don't go looking too far. You're right here. And she was right. In messages of condolence, people have mentioned Grandma's giving heart, her kindness, her special spirit, and all of these things are true. They were true in front of the world, and they were true behind closed doors. She was resilient. She was the strongest woman I will ever know. She gave selflessly and loved us all endlessly. She was uncommon and magnificent. Although I know we were all made more for having known her, I can't help feeling the world has made a little less since she left. How lucky we were, how lucky we are to have claimed her as our own. My memories of mother are every day she would have to listen to or watch um, a certain soap opera and then Bev's mother and she would get together with coffee and talk about the events of that day on the, on the T 
TV, but I remember one time there was, Mom said, uh, in the TV program, there was a guy that was kicked out of an airplane. And Mom says, oh, he's such a thug. And if, they, if he lives through the, falling out of that airplane, I'm never going to watch this again. So luckily he died, so she got to continue. <laughs> but a mother always, she had a friend by the name of Ruth, whose husband was not a very nice man. She had five children. Mother would clean out the deep freeze every year when they would buy beef for the year. And mother would make sure that Ruth got all of that food to take care of her kids. And Ruth was from Virginia, and she called my mother Merle. And she would call, and she could never figure out how all of us knew it was Ruth, because she would call, is Merle there? <laughs> so we knew that Ruth was on the line. Um, Mom was such a good person. She loved everybody. She cared about everybody. And she took such good care of us. I'm going to miss her. Mine's just quick. Uh, Mom's family, family and friends, the family really counted. Kim got married, I got married, it's just like she got two more daughters. She just, she loved them to death and they loved her to death. I call her when she's in high gate. She's got uh, the three of our children. She would start right there and ask, well, is so-and-so still doing this? Is so -and -so? This was up within two weeks when she passed away. Then she had to go through eight great-grandchildren. <laughs> and she'd start at the oldest one. She had them in the same order every time. It was the same thing. Is Brock doing this? Is this one doing this? And this is doing that. And then she would get down to the last one. <laughs> and you could see her smile over the phone. She said, and what has Elizabeth done to you today? <laughs> That's going to be Elizabeth's only bad thing to try to cure her wife is she's got the Peterson humor. <laughs> and sometimes it'll get you. But she was very loving and she never missed a lick to find out how everybody was. And when Brock got married, our oldest grandson, she said, well, it's going to start even out. I got another granddaughter today. She was just short ones. So. Thank you. Well, I have to say it's not nearly so poignant as the family. But when we were, we were married in 1968, and that December, we came home for Christmas from Roseman, and Wayne said, let's go see the Petersons. Have a good cheer with them. Oh, okay. So we went there, and we were unannounced, I and mean, we hadn't made any arrangements at all, but we were so welcome, and we laughed from the time we walked in the door until we finally walked out. And I thought, this is the most jolly bunch of people that I have ever met in my life. <laughs> and after Ken passed by, then we would still go at Christmas time and call on Muriel and have our cup of cheer. I've got one other thing. I told you to be short, I lied to you, Will. <laughs> When Mom moved to Billings, um, I, I was doing all the paperwork and all this and that, and then Christmas rolled around. 
And she said, I just have a few. So she gets the address book out, and when I was all done, I filled out 50 Christmas cards, just a few. So the next year, she said, you know, I think, I think we'll cut that list down. So her and I sat down, and we went through the list, and she got rid of two. <laughs> It didn't get any better. So last year, she said, we're not sending any Christmas cards. I said, I've got a better idea. We'll call them. So last year, she said, yeah, just a few minutes on the phone. <laughs> Some of the people we called, that was interesting, because I put the phone on speaker so I could listen in on them. And these, these were old, old people that they had worked with and this and that. Some of them phone calls lasted for an hour. And we went through like 45 of them. <laughs> and we didn't do them all in one day. We would space them out. But she, we called everywhere from Florida to Alaska. And, and she thoroughly enjoyed that more than she sent them a Christmas card. Yeah. And, uh, but yeah, we're going to call this out. So she got rid of one or two. <laughs> Thank you. I'm Julie Jordan. I don't know if I can get through this. And this to me is a funny story. Um, I don't know. Muriel was a beautiful lady. I always so enjoyed going to visit with her when Renee and I go up to buildings or here in Miles City. But looking back now, I wonder how Muriel made it 96 years with Ken, <laughs> Ken, <laughs> Gary, and Renee. And now I know where they got their sense of humor. <laughs> she was a beautiful lady. As I said earlier, this is not the last time to share these stories. This is just another mile marker on the road. There are three readings for today. And the first is the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. The Lord makes me lie down in green pastures. The Lord leads me beside still waters. The Lord restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And then from the fourth psalm, verse 8, I will lie down and sleep in peace, for you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. And the gospel for this day is a very familiar one. John 3.16 For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. As we are remembering, as we are celebrating, as we are sharing these stories, we are talking about a saint. And as we are gathered here, we all get to claim that name, that name that has been given to us, one of saints. Now, I have heard 
that Muriel loved everybody, she cared for everybody, and we all know that there are people, well, I call them EGRs, extra grace required. And we all have those people. But the thing about being a saint, about being a child of God, is not that we don't have those people and every thought is pure and holy. It's that we walk as God's people, as God's forgiven people. Muriel, I, you know, I've, I've gotten to know some of the Petersons fairly well, Brian and his family, and I roped Bryce into helping me out with Little League a couple years in a row, getting to know Ken and Marge, getting to know Renee just a little bit. And there is something that I've seen handed down. And love and service is absolutely a part of the legacy Muriel has handed down. But there's another S word, not service. There's stubbornness. <laughs> and that's a beautiful thing. That is a beautiful trait that I see in the Peterson family. And we ask ourselves in these times, what legacies are handed down? What are the pieces that we want to keep on handing on to the next generation and the next generation? Love, service, and stubbornness, I think, are three great things to hand down. These simple words of Scripture that are so foundational for us, for God so loved the world that God gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. It all starts with the love of God. I think we tend to make life a little too complicated. When we look at what it means to be a saint, what it means to be a child of God, I think too often we try to make the, uh, the line that it's an easy thing to be a child of God. It's an easy thing to be a saint, but it's, it's very complex. There's all these things that you have to do. But I don't think it's that way at all. I don't think being a saint is easy but complex. I think being a saint is simple, but it's hard. How easy is it to give a smile to somebody? It may be very simple, but it may not be very easy when you're going through your own grief and trauma. How complex is it to love your neighbor when they show up unannounced? It may not be complex at all. It's offering a word of welcome. It's offering a meal, perhaps, when maybe you know that you don't have all that much to begin with. It's not complex, but it can be hard. This is who we are called to be, the people who are simple, and do the hard things. Those things that for God so loved the world, what did God do for us? Jesus, the Word of God incarnate, living, loving, showing, inviting us into this path of discipleship. Was it complex for Jesus to lay down his life? No, but it was hard. What does it mean for us to lay down our lives for others? There's not a lot of forms to fill out. It's not complicated, but it's hard. It's not easy, but it's simple. To stop and offer someone a smile, a laugh, to offer up your life in service. One of the things I noticed from visiting Muriel at Highgate is that folks tended to gather around her. And there was one time, uh, Muriel was asleep, and I was at Highgate visiting another congregation member, and I thought, I'll just pop up, and I'll see Muriel. And I knocked, and there was no answer. And I was probably knocking too daintily. I didn't want to disturb. And so I knock, and I wait a little bit, and I knocked again. And then a friend of Muriel's, a little woman with dark hair, came 
and thought maybe I was causing trouble <laughs> and tried to scare me away from her room. I said, no, 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 I'm, I'm Pastor Will from Peace Lutheran. And, and she said, well, if you want to get her attention, you've got to knock harder than that. And she stepped forward and knocked on the door and then roused Muriel. And, and I wish I could, do you remember the friend's name? Yes. Ted, there we go. I don't, didn't remember the name, but this little force, I was not forget. The legacy that we leave behind is seen in the way that folks remember us, the way that folks pick those traits that they say, I want the way Muriel did this, I want to do it that way too. How are we called to be saints? Not in perfection, but in mercy in love, in service, in forgiveness. This is who we are called to be, and this is who we are. It's not easy, but complex. It's simple, but it's hard. And just as the psalmist said, surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. We are not alone on this journey. We are in community. We are in relationship. Amen. And continuing the theme of relationship, the next hymn that was chosen is What a Friend We Have in Jesus.
Let us pray again. Almighty God, in holy baptism you have knit your chosen people together into one communion of saints in the body of Christ. Give to your whole church in heaven and on earth your light and your peace. Grant that all who have been baptized into Christ's death and resurrection may die to sin and rise to share the new life in Christ. Give courage and faith to all who mourn and a sure and certain hope in your loving care that casting all their sorrow on you, they may have strength for the days ahead. Grant to us who are still in our pilgrimage and who walk as yet by faith that where this world groans in grief and pain, your Holy Spirit may lead us to bear witness to your light and life. Help us in the midst of things we cannot understand to believe and to trust in the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection to life everlasting. God of all grace, we give you thanks, because by his death, our Savior Jesus Christ destroyed the power of death. And by his resurrection, he opened the kingdom of heaven to all believers. Make us certain that because he lives, we shall live also, and that neither death, nor life, nor things present, nor things to come, will be able to separate us from your love in Christ Jesus our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Before we join in the Lord's Prayer, there is a, another piece of music to be shared.
join with me as we pray in the way that our Lord and Savior taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. So let us commend Muriel to the mercy of God, our Maker and Redeemer. Into your hands, O merciful Savior, we commend your servant Muriel. Acknowledge, we humbly beseech you, a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, a sinner of your own redeeming. Receive her into the arms of your mercy, into the blessed rest of everlasting peace, and into the glorious company of the saints of light. Amen. Amen.
Yeah, I think for that open spot over here works. You watch it while you're driving? Well, I can start to get that area. No, we can't stream from out here. Your voice impression. Grace and peace from our Savior Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Holy God, holy and powerful, by the death and burial of Jesus, your anointed, you have destroyed the power of death and made holy the resting places of all your people. Keep our sister Muriel, whose body we now lay to rest, in the company of all your saints. And at the last, O oh God, raise her up to share with all the faithful the endless joy and peace, won through the glorious resurrection of Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Ensure and certain hope of the resurrection to eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ, we command to Almighty God, our sister Miriam, we commit her body to its resting place earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. The Lord bless her and keep her. The Lord's face shine upon her with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon her with favor and give her peace. Amen. Rest eternal, grant her, O Lord, and let light perpetual shine upon her. Let us pray. Merciful God, you heal the broken in heart, and you bind up the wounds of the afflicted. Strengthen us in our weakness, calm our troubled spirits, and dispel our doubts and fears. In Christ's rising from the dead, you conquered death and opened the gates to everlasting life. Renew our trust in you that by the power of your love, we shall one day be brought together again with our sister Muriel. Grant this, we pray, through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, make you complete in everything good, so that you may do God's will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in God's sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. That concludes our graveside service.